missed you. Tap, tap. Okay, good. How many people signed up as members over lunch? All right, I right, pass your notes to the side over here, and I'll pass them forward as to why not. How many people signed up for the cruise? Great. That's a wonderful response. All right. That's right. Long years ago, I uh, was, was pleasured to participate in the founding of the Advanced uh, Training Program for Heavy Metal Detoxication. And that was through the International College of Integrative Medicine, ICIM. And Boyd Haley has been one of our favorite lecturers for the last 18 years in those programs. And the nice thing about him is he is a fearless leader. And he is absolutely brilliant. Dr. Haley is a professor emeritus of chemistry, biochemistry at the University of Kentucky. What it doesn't say in here is he's also chairman emeritus in the uh, chemistry department, right? Right. Right. And now he spends his time creatively thinking about how do we minimize the inflammatory pathways that are directly related to oxidative stress. He's testified as an expert witness at government hearings on the issues of health hazards of mercury and vaccines, <coughs> dental amalgam, and he is going to give us a wonderful afternoon. Boyd, thank you. Thank you, John. <clears throat> at least I hope I will. You know, I realize if you look at these slides, there's a lot of chemistry down there, and it's not that I expect people who haven't looked at a chemistry book in 20 years to understand that, but it's, it's the foundation that leaves my mouth to say, I need to tell these people this. This is not rocket science. This is very simple, straightforward toxicology, <clears throat> but you need to see the data because when people start talking to me and they don't show me the data, I feel like I, the first used car salesman I ever visited with, you know, I don't believe them. <clears throat> so when you see some of this stuff, don't think that I am so naive as I expect you to follow this, but some of you will. And if you lecture a lot, like in a university, sometimes, you know, you take your lecture up and down, you talk to the masses out there that are sleeping or doodling and drawing pictures of you on the side lines of their paper, and then you take a little bit of the time, 5%, 10%, and you talk to the people that are going to go out with that education and make a difference. So I just wanted to explain that before we started. <clears throat> the, the other thing is, this is a, like a homecoming for me, and of sorts, to come back to Monterey Bay. My first experience with mercury was in Monterey Bay. It would happened in 1964. I was a young soldier going through basic training at Fort Ord, which is no longer here, I gather. Yeah, well, yeah, it's hard to replace it, I guess. <clears throat> but anyway, I, I ended up like every other soldier at that time. You took off your shirt, held it in your hand, and you walked by, and there were people on both sides of you with air guns shooting you with vaccines. And I don't know, Mega, at least nine. But the next by that afternoon, I couldn't walk. I mean, I was in a, a, a dispensary, and I wasn't alone. I had a lot of friends. Two days later, I got up and walked out and went back into training. And some of my friends went with me, and some of them stayed there, and some of them I never saw again. I don't think they died. I just think they were sick too long that they just went out of cycle. And so they had to cycle with the next group of GIs coming through. But that was 48 years ago. And so here I am today, because that was in uh, November. Uh, at that time, so it was uh, not far away. And that's how I got into the mercury thing, or at least understanding it. When I was through the Army, through graduate school, through postdoc, had my first job, and had enough money in my pocket to buy contact lens, because for those of you who don't know me, I'm an avid outdoorsman. I like to duck hunt, I like to ski, I like to fly fish, I do all that stuff. And when the person put the contact lens solution in my eye, they set me on fire. My eye, I mean, was just the whole side of my head turned up bright red. And the, the young lady who was optometrist, a very nice young lady and very competent, said, oh, you have sensitive eyes. Well, yeah, if you pour gas in it. <laughs> I mean, I've I mean, never had my eye do that before. <clears throat> but the bottom, bottom line is she, she told me what the Marisol was. She said, oh, it's the Marisol. It's a preservative, and some people are sensitive to it. And uh, being a chemist, I, I looked it up because I wanted to know. And she also informed me I should never take a flu shot because the flu shot was loaded with that. Well, what would happen if I take a flu shot first? Well, you get really sick is what it comes down to. But I looked up the Marisol, and I thought the chemical reactivity of this stuff, who would put that in any human being? What a stupid thing to do. And then I forgot about it. And I went off in my life and uh, finally got back into this thing to people like uh, 
Dave Kennedy, Hal Huggins, and others that drug me into looking at the mercury toxicity. But, but I'm going to have a message here today, and, and part of it's going to come up with uh, the concept of oxidative stress and why it's so uncommon. Because if you're sick, you're under oxidative stress. That's almost the definition of every illness you have. There's hardly an illness that I know, I don't know of a one, where you <clears throat> uh, are low in energy, aching, etc., where when they check your, your level uh, or what they call the oxidative stress level of your body, that you're not suffering from oxidative stress. Now, where this is going is that nothing, absolutely nothing in the world induces oxidative stress more than mercury and more permanently than mercury. And we're going to show you how that does that. And mercury can only be made worse by working with a mouth that's infected with root or with uh, periodontal disease or root canals. I mean, it's just incredible. And I have to thank Hal Huggins for introducing me to that because he's tenacious and driving me crazy until I looked at the toxicity of some root because I thought he was nuts, like I thought most everybody in this area was nuts. But what, are, what, what we're going to talk about here, it's the unusual biochemical structures of the mitochondrial electron transport system. See, we're transporting electrons in this system and it goes down through iron sulfur centers, and the oxygen you breathe is the terminal electron acceptor in that system, unless you're mercury toxic. And then, the, I mean, you, you, and it makes water. In, in a particular case with mercury there, it blocks it, and it transfers that electron to oxygen, making superoxide anion, and so you don't make any energy, so you're listless. You have low energy level, and you're producing one of the most toxic and reactive chemicals known to man in your own body. And they call that mitochondrial dysfunction. And it's these iron sulfur centers that make it susceptible to mercury and other toxin damage. You'll hear written many times when people talk about medicine, they'll say, oh, these autistic children, they all suffer from mitochondrial dysfunction. Dysfunctional mitochondrial. Well, yeah, we know that. But what causes that dysfunction? Well, don't ask the tough question. Don't ask the obvious question, because then you start looking at what pushes this over. And so we can say any sulfur reactive toxin, bacterial, viral yeast, or fungal produced, and, and heavy metals, would disrupt the system and allow catalytic production of reaction, reactive oxygen species. Why this is critical <clears throat> is that when we say sulfur reactive, if you look in cavitation, the material we've gotten from many of you from cavitations or jawbone osteonecrosis, if you pull out an infected tooth, that's got periodontal disease, if you even scrape some of the stuff off of it, they are thioreactive. They're very thioreactive compounds. And they work because they want. Now, how can such a small amount, and you'll see some of the data we have from some of these infected, how can such a small amount of a compound be so toxic? That's what your ignorant dental colleagues, they want to say, oh, it's just too little don't understand. And it's right here when we say one, mo one molecule or one atom of mercury can cause the production of orders of magnitude of reactive oxygen species such as hydroxy uh, uh, radical, free radical. One molecule. And so what it does, it takes your mitochondria <clears throat> that makes thousands of molecules of ATP so you can run a marathon. You're burning up ATP, the mitochondria is making more and replacing it. When you go in and damage that mitochondria and you transfer that flow of electrons into the oxygen where you're making superoxide anion, you make thousands of molecules of toxin and you don't make any ATP. And this is what I'm going to try to get across to you. This makes sense. And most people, even people who teach bioenergetics at the universities, don't understand how toxins can uh, generate the problems that we run into. <clears throat> So when we say chemically, oxidative stress, when they talk about it, we say that as if everybody should understand it, and I can tell you most people don't. It's identified as the overproduction of these oxygen species, for example, the hydroxy free radical, which is that one right there, it's the most toxic, superoxide anion, hydrogen peroxide, due to some malfunction of the body's metabolism. This overproduction first consumes all the reduced glutathione, converting it to oxidized glutathione as follows. Now, the point I'm trying to make here is that Glutathione, we all look at that like, and we worship it. It's the most important antioxidant in your body, and it is. And it will protect you from almost every toxin you run into except mercury. 
And I'm going to show you how mercury just shuts it down cold. First of all, when you generate, you put in mercury, it starts over generating this hydroxy free radical. There it is in red. And there's the glutathione, the molecule that's your first line of defense against this. Because even the best person that has the tightest electron transport system leaks some electrons. Electrons are not very easy to keep corralled. And so you have glutathione, it's the highest concentration of reducing reagent in your body, and it's there to scavenge these hydroxy radicals to keep you younger for a longer period of time. So glutathione sees this hydroxy radical, and it immediately grabs onto that hydroxy radical, produces water, H2O, and you have a glutathione radical. The glutathione radical, since it's in the presence of a lot of other glutathiones, like right here, two of these will react together to form oxidized glutathione. And the free radical is abolished, and this goes on, and it protects you from this compound, from interacting with your DNA, your protein, your membranes, etc. So it's protective. Your body has this built-in protective mechanism as long as you have a high level of glutathione. Now, I want you to know, <clears throat> teenagers, Young people have a high level of glutathione, and you go out here until you hit about 40 or 50, and then it starts going down. As you age, the amount of glutathione drops off dramatically. You're more susceptible to, to all kinds of illnesses, viral infections, etc. We're going to talk about why that happens, and it doesn't happen to. I mean, you can treat yourself and eat such that you can keep your glutathione levels up for a much longer, at a higher level, for a much longer part of time. But when this... <clears throat> When this happens, if you produce billions of these, such that your glutathione cannot keep up with it, and you produce this molecule, you run into other medical problems that we're going to talk about. Your glutathione levels drop. So after consumption of substantial protective glutathione, the hydroxy radical starts chemically reacting with lipids, DNA, RNA, and proteins, causes extensive damage and cell death. <clears throat> That's the reason you get wrinkles when you get older. Wrinkles are due to oxidative stress. Your skin's undergoing oxidative stress because you don't have enough glutathione in your old skin. By the way, I'm 71 years old, so I'm not making fun of anyone. You do, <clears throat> your skin starts wrinkling, and you have, you have to fight this. And it does this by damaging all of the normal proteins in the body, DNA and the RNA as well, and causes extensive damage. The other thing is, we have in our body, or in our cells, a process called apoptosis. It's called programmed cell death. In other words, there are certain cells in your body that on signal are supposed to die. An example would be a woman who has had a child, the child's nursing, and she has mammary development, and then the child stops nursing, and this woman has to recover, and so the mammary glands have to shrink, have to die, have to, you know, die off. And so what happens is you increase the level of GSSG, and it causes that cell to die in a programmed fashion. Just dissipates, it's you know, ameliorated, consumed by the body, and you don't feel any illness with regard to that. Now, if you can stimulate this artificially by making those cells mercury toxic, those cells start going through programmed cell death, even the program shouldn't be going on. You start doing it. It's called muscle wasting disease in old men. I mean, when they start losing their muscle cells, and we don't know why, and they don't, there's no infection, there's no disease you can talk about. You, they are undergoing apoptosis because the glutathione is being oxidized because they're under a level of oxidative stress. This is a good marker. And the reason I'm bringing that up is even today, but in the near future, it's going to be something that all of you are going to be sending blood from your patient to recover the red cells and look for the red cell glutathione levels and the reduced glutathione versus the oxidized glutathione to look at the, the health of your patient. It is a good measure of the health of your patient. Most cases of oxidative stress are elicited by damage to the electron transport system of the mitochondria, which then transfers electrons to oxygen catalyzed, catalytically producing hydroxide, pardon me, superoxide anion and hydroxy radical, as we talked about. The other thing you learn when you teach students at the University of Kentucky and certain other places is you tell students what you're going to tell them, you tell them what you told them, and then you tell them again. So you'll hear a lot of my stuff. If I repeat it three times, it's going to be on the test. You can count on it. So this, this is the kind of thing that everyone who takes a patient and says, I'm a doctor and I'm going to improve your health, you should know this about glutathione. 
It serves as a frontline antioxidant, keeping all of our enzymes protected from oxidation. In other words, the enzymes in our body that make proteins, that make DNA, all the way down the line, GSH is what protects us. This is important, for example, if a baby or an infant comes into you or even into your dental chair and they're sick and you feel a fever, then you know that there's something wrong, that they don't have the glutathione to protect them. So don't do anything stupid with them. Don't give them Tylenol, which depletes glutathione. Don't try to give them a, a certain other thing. So you've got to be very careful to know that this has to be there and this can drop. It can go up and down very quickly in different people. This also applies to old people. It serves as a natural chelator for the excretion of many heavy metals, including mercury, lead, and cadmium. In other words, when we do bring in, I mean, many of you probably know the story that people that have two or three dental amalgams, if they get hit by a truck, and you look at the mercury in their brain or in their tissues, their mercury levels are quite low. But as the number of amalgams go up, it starts, the mercury in their body goes up logarithmatically. Because the more mercury you have, the lower your glutathione goes, and the more your body retains that mercury because it binds to proteins, and you don't have the glutathione to bind it and take it out of your body. Mercury leaves your body primarily by two routes. The minor route is in your urine, and that's because mercury can bind to cysteine, an amino acid, in your plasma, and it gets excreted into the urine. It's less than 10% of the total excretion. The second and the most prominent way, over 90% of it goes out bound to thiol. I think, yeah, it's there. So that's the one that we have to do. So we want to keep this level high. So when we have our swordfish dinner, we don't keep that mercury in our body. We want that mercury going out. Or if we breathe mercury vapor by kissing this beautiful girl who has 10 amount of fillings, we want to make sure we can get rid of that mercury. Okay. So, then, or vice versa, right? Glutathione is attached to many water-insoluble toxicants by an enzyme called glutathione as transferase, allowing them to become water-soluble and excreted as the GS toxin complex. We'll talk about that with regard to uh, Tylenol addicts. There are some molecules that when they get in your body, they're oily, so they're not out in the water. Glutathione doesn't get to them. I mean, nothing can catch them. They get into your lipid bilayer, and if they get high enough, they'll make you sick. So what the body does is it uses a trick called a P450 system. It puts a charge on that organic molecule, like a hydroxy radical, and then you have this enzyme that takes glutathione and attaches it to that hydrophobic molecule, and now it's water-soluble. Then more than that, it has a handle on it. So if, if you look at it, this is the reason why you cannot take glutathione, IV, and have it go into your cells. The level of glutathione in a cell is 1,000 to 10,000 times higher than it is in your plasma. Why is that? And the reason is, when God put us together, he said, you know, we've got to have a way to get the crash out of the body. So I've got to make a system. And this system is, if something's in the body that I don't want there, I'm going to go modify it. It's called a P450 enzyme. Put a hydroxy. And then I'm going to put a, a, something on it that's an arm that reaches out that something can grab and get rid of it. It's going to mark it for excretion. And that's what happens in your body, even when mercury gets glutathione bound to it, it's not like normal glutathione anymore, but it has that end hanging out that is very chemically selective for binding to certain carrier molecules in the membrane that will bind that glutathione with the toxin bound and throw it out into the bloodstream. That's a good thing to do, but then you've got to get rid of it because you want things to go downhill. It's called the free energy process. And so when that mercury <clears throat> or when that glutathione labeled toxins in the bloodstream, you've got to be able to get rid of it. And you can, and that's the reason it's so low. When it passes through the liver, there's a thing called the biliary transport system that sees molecules with glutathione attached or even straight glutathione, grabs that glutathione because it recognizes it's called a lock and key grabs that glutathione and transfers it into the bile, where if it's a virus, it's killed. If it's another thing, it's just excreted into the fecal material. 90% of the mercury goes out in the fecal material. So when you put glutathione in the blood, it doesn't have a chance to get into the cells because the liver grabs it first. It'll clear it in two or three passes and put it into the feces, even if it's pure, unadulterated glutathione. So if you're going to try and get glutathione, you have to do a different process than that. 
It, it can react with certain yeast and fungal toxins. Most of you, or a lot of you, would know about gliotoxin. This is one of the molecules that's made in uh, uh, periodontal disease. It has two sulfur groups. It's very reactive. Glutathione, or it's a disulfide, actually. Glutathione binds to that and inhibits it. Thing. I'm not going to talk a lot about that, but I have in the past. And we're going to talk about how glutathione prevents viral infections, including the influenza virus and the AIDS virus. Glutathione, when it comes up to a virus, and most of you have seen pictures of virus, they have the coat proteins, all very symmetrically surrounding the nucleic acid of the virus. Those coat proteins are held by disulfide linkages, and glutathione inserts itself into that glutathione linkage. So you have a virus walking around the bloodstream, not walking, but floating around, with a glutathione handle on it. What happens to it when it goes through the liver? The liver picks it up, puts it in the bile, and that virus is taken from your body. That is how you get over the flu, because we don't have any antibiotics for flu that work effectively at all. And so we're going to talk about that. <clears throat> and we can talk about this glutathione conversion to apoptosis as a way of looking at the, the deal here. So let's talk about the oral chemistry of mercury that associates, and it'll flip right back into the glutathione problem. Mercury released from dental amalgams with organic files to produce hydrophobic toxins that are more potent than HG2+, due to their ability to penetrate cell membranes and cross the blood-brain barrier. Uh, you know, I have to give credit for people in this room for pointing out that possibility to me because I wouldn't have believed it without that. And this is a simple cartoon. And what I want to tell you, this is simple and it's not even right. It's partly right, but there are compounds. Oops. There are compounds that come out of dead teeth that make hydrogen sulfide and methylphile look like ice cream. I mean, they're much more toxic. I don't know what they are. I can tell you they're thio. I can tell you they're hydrophobic. But there's so such a small amount of them, that, and that, you know, the lack of funding for this type of thing makes it impossible to determine. But if we look <clears throat> at, a, say, a normal mouth. And we have a, a mouth with an amalgam filling, putting off mercury vapor, which can, by uh, galvanism, etc., can lose two electrons to make <clears throat> HG2+. And next to that, you have an avital tooth. I should have drawn a root canal through there, but I didn't. I ran out not that artistic. And we know that these anaerobes, we know one thing that they absolutely do, and there's a reason you have bad breath and how they check you for periodontal disease, is it takes cysteine, metabolizes it and produces hydrogen sulfide, takes methionine in the metabolism and makes methylthione. If you re-add these to mercury in the same mouth, this one here will make mercury sulfide, cinnabar, and you get this amalgam tattoo. And that's what gave me the first hint of this when I was looking at some of the slides that the dentist would show. And you see this great big purple part on the thing. And I'd say, well, what is it? Well, it's an amalgam tattoo. Well, how'd it get there? Well, when you were drilling, it threw up a chunk of amalgam, stuck it in there, and it kind of just went, no. Nah. Because I later on had a daughter who had a root canal here, an amalgam tattoo here, and the only amalgam she had was in her back jaw. <clears throat> Didn't make sense. <clears throat> and then I've had a person by the name of Graham Hall, a lot of you know him, I sent him. Or he, he sent me some amalgam tattoos that he'd sliced out, and we measured the mercury level, and they're incredibly high. I mean, mercury and silver. So what it is, it's just the reaction of the mercury with hydrogen sulfide from an infected site near that tooth. And if you see if you see a, an amalgam tattoo, you can bet there's an infection there that's releasing hydrogen sulfide. Because what's precipitated in, in that purple area is mercury sulfide as well as silver sulfide. Now, and that but I would point out to you also, mercury sulfide just isn't that toxic. Once it's formed, it's not very reactive. It's what what's how it's found, formed in the earth. The other thing, though, any thiol group that comes out that's a hydrophobic molecule reacts with mercury and can make these hydrophobic organic mercury compounds that are incredibly toxic. And we have made these in our laboratory by taking mercury chloride and reacting it with methyl thiol. Isolating the compounds, adding up to cells, incredibly lethal because they can pass the blood-brain barrier. They're incredibly toxic. Uh, they're slow. They're not as quickly reactive as HG2+. Plus. It reacts very quickly with proteins. These react very slowly and it allows them to concentrate in the central nervous system, build up, and cause toxicity beyond belief. And we'll talk about the toxicity on many of these. And, <clears throat> but this is something that no one that knows a nickel's worth of periodontal disease or uh, periodontitis, uh, the aspect is to argue that this chemistry wouldn't happen and you wouldn't be making these very toxic hydrophobic organic mercury compounds in your mouth if you had periodontal disease 
or a root canal and uh, an amalgam filling. It's a bad, bad combination, a very bad combination. So here's the, here's the overall thing, and through the red is what I want you to follow, because there are other things that cause mitochondrial dysfunction leading to the production of hydroxy radicals. Heavy metal toxicity is the one we're interested in here today. There are genetic issues, there are glutamate toxicity. Um, Blaylock, Dr. Blaylock talks about this quite a bit. But on this one, heavy metals, inhibition of electron transport system, there's no doubt. There have been thousands of studies when I was a, a graduate student. Put mercury in, killed the electron transport system of mitochondria. You can't make ATP if you have mercury around mitochondria. And this leads to mitochondrial dysfunction, leading to hydroxy radical production. Where is this prominent? Everyone that has Alzheimer's disease has dysfunctional mitochondria. Every autistic child has dysfunctional mitochondria. You go down the diseases that we don't know the cause of, and we see oxidative stress that is caused by dysfunctional mitochondria. Now, please, you have to have a, a, a rancher's sense of chemistry to follow this. In every cell, there could be hundreds to a thousand mitochondria. If you kill 20% of them, you are operating at a lower level than anyone else. You're still living. It doesn't kill you because people say, well, why don't you just die? Well, because you, you've got so many mitochondria, and this problem here can be happening in only 10%, 20%, 30%, or 40%. So each of us, when we get a certain level of toxicity, have a different response. You can live and be mercury toxic. You're not going to be what you could be or all that you could be if you have this problem. Because when a mercury atom gets into the cell, it goes into mitochondria, it gets into one, and it shuts off that electron transport system. Is that enough to make that mitochondrial non-functional? No, because there are probably thousands of these electron transport chains in each mitochondria, and there are hundreds to thousands of mitochondria in every cell. So it's when you slowly build up a lot of mercury and you start decreasing enough of those electron transport chains that you start getting sick and you start having functional problems such as fibromyalgia and certain other things. But in the cells where you get enough of these dysfunctional mitochondria, you start consuming your glutathione. As it goes here, this glutathione drops off and these two gestures, so you see the oxidized glutathione go up, reduced glutathione goes down. When you deplete the glutathione, then the excess hydroxy radicals being made can cause all kinds of damage. And this is what you see in Alzheimer's disease, multiple sclerosis, uh, Parkinson's disease, because you can find, isolate these tissues from these people, isolate these molecules from the tissues of these people, and you can see that they're oxidized. They are having, they're being damaged. They're suffering from oxidative stress, which wouldn't happen if they weren't depleted of glutathione. The other aspect of this is the loss of antiviral protection. Who is it that gets sick? Who is it that dies of the flu? When they say people die of the flu, it's never the young people, always the older people. And what we know is you get older, your glutathione levels go down. When they were talking about people dying of the flu, the H1N1, and they would say, but he had a compromising medical problem. What does that mean? They never tell you what it is, but it tells you one thing, his glutathione levels are down. So you want to keep your glutathione levels up because that is how you fight the flu and exactly how you fight the, fight the HIV virus also. The other thing is if you increase this, the increase of glutathione, you get induced apoptosis. That's just another way of killing your cells painlessly. But because, you know, if you have an infection, your cells are dying, you damn well feel it, right? I mean, you know when you're sick from something like an infection, a bacterial infection of a certain piece of tissue. The pain is there. Or certain people can die of this induced apoptosis, and there's really not much pain associated with it, except just the lack of energy and uh, lack of viability. Now, why is the mitochondria? These, these are cartoons, by the way, but they're not cartoons that are necessarily I made. I've copied them out of books. Well, this is my own artistic rendition, as reading it's so lousy. <clears throat> but the electron transport chain, when you take an electron off of the food you've eaten, most of you know this, you eat glucose. You go through glycolysis, you make pyruvate. Pyruvate goes into the mitochondria, gets into the citric acid cycle, spins around, releases NADH, reducing equivalent. NADH is the first electron donor to the electron transport system. It goes back to NAD, it goes back up to be re-reduced. So you do a cyclic thing. So you have plenty of material 
I mean from the glucose you ate, to make electrons. And as the electron goes down that electron transport system, it makes a pH gradient, and you make ATP from that. But if you don't have that electron transport system to go and, and be exactly in the way it should be, the electrons block up, pile up behind it, and start being leaking into the uh, cytosol and into the oxygen and water, and you make hydroxy radicals. So this is what a natural one looks like, and you've got to understand. This mercury vapor coming off an amalgam filling can penetrate the cell membranes, can get in your blood, you breathe it, it gets into the cell, it doesn't react, it's like a, a stealth invader. It slides around the cytosol, some of it goes up and knocks off some cytosolic enzymes, can bond it, but some of it can go right up to the mitochondria and go right through the two mitochondrial membranes and get inside the mitochondria where this electron transport system exists. Almost nothing can get there. But mercury vapor gets there like that. When it gets in that region, it gets oxidized to the toxic form. In other words, it's now somebody pulled the pin on the grenade and it reacts with this electron transport chain by disrupting it, causing the electrons not to go. Now, here's where we get to some chemistry, which <clears throat> just a few of you will understand. HG2 plus doesn't go back and forth to HG1 to two, one to two, just can't do it. The energy required to remove and change that electron is just too great. But Fe2 to Fe3 is very easy to do. It is something that we, I mean, that does it very easy, and that's the reason we have iron in our electron transport system. But when you get the HG2 plus there, an electron coming this direction, hitting in here or here, it stops, and it has to be released. It piles up, and that's where you get the electron coming out of the mitochondria. Plus, you release these iron atoms, and iron is a, a big problem in the Fenton reaction, and iron can go from two to three and catalytically make, take the electrons out of the electron transport system and transfer them to oxygen, and you see a great big in pr uh, production of superoxide anion, which is the first step of oxidative stress. Now, I, I apologize for people who hate chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> but, but some of you need to, you need to catch this. But uh, you know, it induces radical formation because they say you, you talk to certain people and they say you cannot have the electrons and mercury go back and forth and make hydroxy radicals. No, you can't. It just goes in and kicks the hell out of the electron transport system, and the electron transport system does it for because it has the iron and the electrons to do it. So displacing this iron two to three, which can go back and forth from normal electron transport, causes the electron to uh, exchange needed to converting hydrogen peroxide and hydroxy radicals, you know, uh, i.e. it induces the Fenton reaction. Inhibiting enzymes that biologically remove HTO by breaking down to water. This is the other thing that mercury does at the same time as lousing up the electron transport system. It inhibits the enzymes, the peroxidases, that remove hydrogen peroxide from your body, which is uh, the step right before we make hydroxy radicals. So, pardon me. This is the chemistry for those of you that really want to write this down and memorize it. Okay, but but it really, it, I mean, and and the reason I give this is not to try and, and, and crush, but to let you know that this has worked out. This is not magic. This is stuff that's been known since I was a graduate student. You know, you have O2 that you breathe. And if you, you know how you try to get along without oxygen for a minute or two, it doesn't work well, does it? Because, you, it, you know, it usually goes to make ATP and water when it goes down a normal electron transport chain. You throw in a toxin that distresses that electron transport chain, and that electron has to go somewhere. It's not going to sit there. It's very hard to corral an electron. It goes, and what it usually goes to is something other oxygen molecule, the one there, and you end up with superoxide anion, which is, you know, uh, you know, you, uh, you know, converted to hydrogen peroxide by uh, superoxide uh, dismutase, and you make hydrogen peroxide. And if you're a healthy person, the peroxidase, the peroxidases, primarily glutathione peroxidase, will take this hydrogen peroxide to water, and you're home free. You've gotten rid of that piece of toxicity. If it doesn't and it gets here and you can't get rid of it, if your catalase is inhibited, and that's what mercury does, is it inhibits this peroxidases, doesn't inhibit the catalases so much, but then you build up hydrogen peroxide and then you have this disrupted iron knocked off of the electron transport system, which is iron rich. You, you should know that, that uh, systems, muscles that use a lot of energy, they, you know how, how uh, uh, wild duck, 
or you know, ha or if you look at a chicken, let's still use a chicken. The dark meat. What is the dark meat? It's where they flap their wings and run. They use a lot of energy. The breast doesn't do anything. If you go to a duck, a wild duck, which is just the opposite, they don't run anywhere, but they fly thousands of miles. Their breast will be real dark, and their wings will be—I mean, their legs will be white. And what it is when you have real dark meat is because of the mitochondria. And what you're looking at when you see that darkness is the heme or the iron that's bound up in that electron transport system because those cells have thousands of more uh, mitochondria than do the white meat. And so for healthy, if you want iron, well, eat dark meat. That's what, it, that's what it's all about. But anyway, when you get here, the Fenton reaction takes that. If this hydrogen peroxide builds up because mercury's pushing a lot of this down here, it's inhibiting the enzyme that gets rid of it. So you end up with a lot of substrate for the iron and copper to produce hydroxy radicals, which is why we get oxidative stress. So I am not going to spend a lot of time on this because I, I want to make sure I get through all of this without you guys throwing eggs at me. And we've already talked about this, and this is mainly a repeat of what we have. But it does tell you that it does have several functions, and this is the reason why we have to address this. But we can say that when someone is really sick, if you build their glutathione levels back up by giving them a lot of antioxidant in their uh, diet, giving them the proper food, they can take an enzyme that's active, SH and active with reactive oxygen species, and it can form an inactive complex plus hydrogen peroxide. Glutathione can take this inactive enzyme, as we see right here, and because it's more reactive, we'll pull this SH group off, reactivating that enzyme and getting a product that's excreted from the body. So you detoxify it. But you've got to get the glutathione levels up to get the detoxification done. If you have an enzyme that's active that runs into a mercury atom, HG2+, you get this inactive enzyme with mercury form. If you take this enzyme that has mercury attached and you attach it to glutathione, the, in, the glutathione will pull the mercury off this enzyme, reactivating it, and end up with mercury attached to glutathione, which finds another glutathione, and it makes this diglutathione mercury that's not reactive at all, and that's what's excreted from your body. So to get rid of these things, I mean, to detox, you have to elevate glutathione. Now, Dr. Tom Levy, I don't know if he's here or not, but he talks about how can you do that. Well, there are certain things that will definitely increase glutathione levels in your body. Anything that increases NADH will uh, cause the glutathione to become more redox. Vitamin C, many of the other, vitamin A and some of the others will do it. So it's, it's important that we know that even though you're sick and you have a blast of this, you can reverse these things. This is all published in the literature in many different papers. But again, I'll find, you cannot increase body glutathione levels by eating glutathione alone. If we would, we'd have no trouble. We could just raise animals really clean and, and do that. This is the structure of glutathione. And <clears throat> again, uh, the test at the end of this will be you have to all repeat this structure. <laughs> but the thing I want you to talk about, if you look at it, there's a negative charge there. There's a positive charge there and a negative charge there. That means this molecule is very water soluble. And it's very good at finding uh, mercury and, and certain other things as long as it's in the water aspect of the body. Why can't we get over mercury toxicity? Because it's only been recently <clears throat> that we have decided in history. I mean, when we evolved with our knuckles dragging the ground, we didn't, we didn't, have, we didn't breathe mercury vapor. Nobody put them out on films in our mouth. Nobody shot thimerosal or ethyl mercury into our arms. We didn't eat fish that were so mercury toxic as before. So glutathione worked just fine for primitive man. And it worked real fine until the English started the Industrial Revolution by burning coal and mercury started coming out. And then we said, oh, mercury, what is this silver stuff that ends up in this where we're burning coal? Mercury sulfide is in coal. That's the reason it's called dirty coal, if it has a lot of mercury sulfide. When you burn that coal to get the calories out of the coal to heat water, it bursts, it breaks the bond between the mercury and the sulfur, and you have mercury vapor going up one side and uh, mercaptoethanol, uh, pardon me, uh, hydrosulfide going up the other. And you separate them. And if you had a big stack, the mercury would cool off and fall down, and they would find puddles of mercury liquid around, and people started thinking it was clever stuff. Or if you threw cinnabar into a campfire, you could actually separate and see pools of mercury, and people, uh, the alchemists thought that this was something that was really cool that would help you get rich and solve a lot of problems.
So this molecule will not help you get mercury because mercury is a hydrophobic gas. And by the way, then I want to tell you, uh, if you take a dome, a glass dome, and set it so it's sealed, and you put in that glass dome two little beakers, one with water and one with oil, and then you put in a small amount of mercury vapor and walk away and let that mercury vapor, I mean that mercury liquid, volatilize, and you come back and you say, well, where did it go? Where do you think it would be? It's in the oil. Mercury does not like water. It does not like oxygen. You don't hear mercury oxide. You never hear them say, well, uh, mercury oxidizing. And it, it doesn't form complexes with oxides. It does not form HGO under normal atmospheric conditions. So the mercury is a lipid soluble. So if there's a mercury atom out here, if one of you guys have been breathing mercury vapor on the rest of us, that mercury atom is coming out. You're getting rid of a small amount of but it's going right back into one of us because it likes our lipid. It'll go right through your skin. And if you don't believe me, here's a trick you can do. You take a little bit of mercury, put it in the palm of your hand, put your finger on it, rub it, rub it, rub it, rub it for a few minutes, and it'll be gone. Magic. And you'll be dumber tomorrow, but you can do that. <laughs> okay. so, so we're going to talk about the role of glutathione in removing it. And this is the one that all of you know about, and I, it's the one thing that, that makes me have you know, a, a a decreased level of respect below normal, which I normally don't have much respect for, the Food and Drug Administration. They approve the, uh, Tylenol, and they let people sell it. Tylenol causes more trips to the poison control centers than any other molecule in the, in the United States. It is incredibly toxic. It's a pain reliever. And the, the reason it does this, it's, it's called acetaminophen. And it's in a lot of different projects. And if you take it, the body sees that. It's very hydrophobic. Look at that. There's not a charge on it. So what happens, the major route is to get it to the bile because they, they do a glucuron redation, or they can get it to go out through the uh, urine by putting a sulfate on it. This is one of the two good ways you can get rid of a, a molecule that the body says, this is toxic and I don't want it in there, just like it's benzene. However, there are enzymes, SIP enzymes, from the P450 system that modify this. We get an arrangement, a chemical rearrangement of this very unnatural molecule into what's they call NAPQI, or if you want to look at it, it's N-acetyl P-benzoquinoamine. And this molecule binds to DNA, RNA. It's very toxic. And what it does, it gets your body excited, so it binds to glutathione. Glutathione conjugates this in an attempt to get rid of it, and it does. It takes it out through the, the biliary transport system. But it does it so well and reacts with it so fast that you die of lack of glutathione. You don't have glutathione to do the processes that you need. So here's the scenario. You have this young, healthy college student who's a binge drinker. He goes out binge drinking. He drinks a lot of alcohol, which causes your glutathione levels to go down. You use a lot of NADH and alcohol dehydrogenase. But he knows he's going to have a headache in the morning, so clever as he is, he throws down a few Tylenols. And then he, when he wakes up, he still has a headache, he throws down more. And then he's on the, the way to the coroner's office. And basically because this molecule depletes glutathione from the body, that's its major function, and it is incredibly, uh, uh, to me, mindless that you allow a product like this to stay on the market when you know it's the major cause of deaths in the United States from uh, med uh, pharmaceutical products. But it does tell you how this can work and how important the glutathione is. You cannot go too low. Now, this is the picture, and, and <clears throat> I want to tell you what, what the experiments are. You, you take, if you want to say what kills, prevents a virus from infecting cells, you take cells that you know are going to be infected by virus A, whatever that virus is, and you grow them in a culture dish, 10 of them. And then if you want to test the product to see if it will prevent that virus from killing those cells, you add it with increasing concentration across those 10 culture dishes. And then you add the virus, and you see how many of the cells are dead. If it doesn't work at all, they'll, you know, the virus will kill all of them. But if you put in glutathione and you do it with increasing concentrations, at a concentration less than what's found inside cells, the glutathione with most viruses will prevent them from being able to infect the cells. And the, making a lot of research simplified and down, the way it does it is that we see proteins, the viral coat protein, and they're loaded with disulfide linkages. They're tight little bundles 
They're very uh, uh, good at uh, protecting the nucleic acid that's in the virus. But glutathione goes there with this GSH. Now, I showed you that structure, and I know you all remember it, but they had that glutathione finger, I mean, this SH finger sticking out. That SH finger comes up to here, and it's called a, you know, a, a thiotransferase reaction. And so this is the blue one on glutathione, two red ones on the virus with the two proteins. This is all one protein. These are called diethyl linkages. You may have 30 of these in a protein coat. Uh, and I can only draw one on here to keep this. But you'll see that the glutathione will stick into there, insert into that PSS linkage where the protein is bound, and the other end is left free. So you now have a, a virus that's coated with glutathione. And when it goes around the plasma and it wants to land on another cell and inject its nucleic acid into that cell to increase the infection, it has to go through the liver. When it goes through the liver, this glutathione end here attracts it, binds that the virus, and puts it into the vial, and it's killed. It's, you know, biliary acids, they're, they're very, 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 very nasty. And so this is how you get rid of this. How the HIV virus supplies and how, it, how we can't get rid of it, I mean, it's a, an incredibly difficult virus to do, and I'll show you the paper on it, but we're not going to talk. It will make a protein that inhibits the synthesis of glutathione in the cells where that virus lives. So how it survives, it's, it, it wouldn't do it in a culture because if you do it in a Petri dish, glutathione kills it. But when it gets inside a cell, it causes the cell to be unable to make the amount of glutathione needed to inhibit its own reaction. And uh, again, well, uh, <clears throat> this is just to let you know I've done my homework. And if you if you you got the slides, you can look this up and read it if you're really interested. But it's the inhibition of influenza infection by glutathione. And what this said. GSH inhibit expression of viral matrix protein and inhibited virally induced caspase activities and fast propagation. Doesn't mean much to you, but to me, it tells me that it's stopped the whole production of the virus inside those cells. And it does that, uh, that. The data suggests that the thio antioxidant glutathione has anti influenza activity in vitro and in vivo. Oxidative stress or other conditions that deplete glutathione in the epithelium of the oral, nasal, and upper airway may therefore enhance the susceptibility to influence infection. Again, that's why older folks are more likely to develop uh, uh, influenza or the flu, because their glutathione levels are low. They can't fight off the viral infections. It's, the glutathione deficiency is associated with impaired survival and HIV disease. Again, I don't want to go through it, but what it does say, it just tells you that it does the same thing it will prevent these HIV uh, viruses from replicating and progressing. But it argues strongly that the unnecessary or excessive use of acetaminophen, alcohol, or other drugs known to deplete glutathione should be avoided by HIV-infected individuals. Now, there's a paper, and I wish, I'd, uh, wish I had it uh, here, but it talked about all the drugs that we commonly use, things that you're taking today. And they, you can measure the ability of drugs to induce oxidative stress by putting it with cells in a culture. Now, how many drugs do you think I know of that don't induce oxidative stress that are sold to you by the pharmaceutical companies? None. Cancer is a disease that's associated with oxidative stress. What, kind, what do the drugs that we take for cancer chemotherapy, what kind of drugs are they? They're, they're oxidative stress inducers. And they'll tell you, well, don't take antioxidants if you're taking cancer drugs because you prevent the cancer drugs from d inducing enough oxidative stress to kill your whole body, but basically, hopefully, to kill the cancer first. So there's, there's some real problems here when we start looking at how our medicine is put together. Maybe we should look at something to treat cancer that's high in reducing equivalents instead of oxidizing equivalents. Just thought. Okay. So this is a mechanism, and this is where we're talking about, you know, the uh, immunodeficiency HIV virus. It says, therefore, TAT appears to decrease glutathione levels in vivo, at least partially through modulation of the GSH biosynthetic enzymes. In other words, this virus has gotten very clever. It prevents you from making the molecule that would kill it and get rid of it. And that's the reason we have a hard time getting rid of HIV. And it also, it, if you have a friend or a relative that's HIV positive and you want to keep them healthy, make sure that they understand they can't take acetaminophen. They shouldn't do things that induce oxidative stress, and they should be taking as much antioxidant supplement-wise as they possibly can tolerate.
That's what will keep them alive. That's the reason you see certain people that get HIV and they're dead within a couple of years. And then you have people, and, and I, 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 don't, I it's widely known, I'm not trying to, like Magic Johnson, who looks very, very healthy, and he's had it for a long time. I think he has the money to buy the treatments that keep him, you know, in a reduced, more reduced state. And so I don't want to stay on this for a long time, but it just, here's where it says, you know, there, these uh, glycoproteins, the envelope proteins, are rich in interchain disulfide bonds and are thus potentially sensitive to the effect of reducing agents such as glutathione because once glutathione marks a molecule or gets into a thing like a virus or a protein, it's going to be excreted from the body. That's the way God put us together. Attach glutathione to it and you'll get rid of it. So, we're getting now to the antioxidant concept, helping maintain a healthy total and reduce glutathione level. And it's a major concern that toxicity and sporadic or chronic illness and infections can reduce total or reduce glutathione for a period of time that recovery is made difficult because of the buildup of many toxins that require consistent higher levels of glutathione for effective removal, they're just not there. And, and what this happens, if you get sick, if you go to uh, uh, any place where you shouldn't be and you eat the wrong food or you, you know, drink the wrong water, you're going to get sick, you're going to get diarrhea, you're going to lose energy, and then you're susceptible. And at those times of your life, you're not going to be able to kick out the toxins that normally come in because your glutathione levels are going to be low. Your whole ability, your whole detox system, even the P450 system is not done. And if we get a significant percentage of mitochondria dysfunctional or damaged, that they start producing uh, hydroxy radicals at a rate that prevents glutathione recovery to a normal level, you're never going to get well. I mean, be blunt, you die. However, if, so if you treat someone in that condition, you have to keep them to where they do not consume energy. You have to get stuck back so the mitochondria recover. You have to get them back in the, uh, uh, in, into a healthy stage where the glutathione levels go up. And uh, by the way, my, I didn't tell anybody, but I, 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 I suppose I'm supposed to give you a conflict of interest. The next compounds we're going to be talking about are owned by a company. I, I kind of invented them and developed many of them, and they're used to address the problems that we've been talking about. So, I mean, I do have a vested interest in this, and I just want you to know that. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. But what I'm saying here, both medical and dental and dietary approaches are needed to help to maintain the health of glutathione level. And so, and you all know that. A lot of you do this. This is... Uh, this is where people use DMPS, and it looks like half of my structure has disappeared. No, you just can't see it. But this is DMSA, or DMPS could be the one, but depending on how you... And people think it's a mercury chelator, and this is the best we have to work today, and it isn't. I mean, Merc uh, DMPS and DMSA are like this in one tile, and this is the other, and the mercury atom is as big as my head. You can't grab it. So what they do is it forms a sandwich complex. There are two DMPSs, or two, two DMSAs, for every mercury atom. It comes off on each side. It does not do this. It cannot. There's just not enough room. And so when, we, when you take DMPS and DMSA, what's the major concern you have, if you're a person who does this medically, is that you can take mercury out of your muscle tissue, out of your gut, etc., get it into the bloodstream, and try to excrete it through the kidney, and what happens if you, if you have too much going through, you dump that mercury because it's not tightly bound into the kidney and you die of renal failure because the mercury from the rest of your body will concentrate in your kidney. That's the reason these molecules are, are not very effective. And I know that because I just did a big review on them and read the papers where people have looked at them. You need something that would bind mercury tighter than this. This, the, the DMSA, like you hear, the sandwich complexes are just not that tight of binding. And so, now why, why do we want to remove mercury? I'm going to tell you something <clears throat> that I firmly believe. You can take all the antioxidants and all the things. If you have a person that is mercury toxic with a mouthful of amalgams and he wants you to treat him and save him, just be very blunt and honest with him. As long as you have those amalgams in your mouth, you're going to have mercury in your body and there ain't no way in hell that taking all the glutathione Vitamin C, NADH, or anything else we give you is going to work. You can't have a car with all the best gas in it and the best tires on it work if the transmission's broke. And that's what mercury does. It clogs up that electron transport system and keeps your system from working. 
There's nothing wrong with antioxidants. I'm very much in favor of supplements, and most of you know. But first and foremost, the patient has to understand it has to get, they have to get the mercury out of their body. And they have to get that that's coming in, from coming in. You have to do that. And that's why we have it. Now, this compound was formerly called OSR for oxidative stress relief. We sold it as a supplement, a dietary ingredient, and the reason we did that, and everyone listened carefully because the FDA said on their website, dietary supplements have to be composed of one or more of the above products, metabolite, vitamin, something natural. It says combined of one or two of the above products. Well, all I don't think so. Okay. If there's a, yeah. Oh, okay. Is that okay now? Okay. But this part here, that's a dicarboxybenzoate. Benzoates, if you look in food, are found in cranberries and apples. The Indians used to make cranberries with deer meat and pound it up and called it pemmican because the benzoates the benzoates would bind to hydroxy radicals and prevent the meat from spoiling. So that is a natural compound. That's a benzoate, dark carboxy benzoate found in apples and cranberries. This molecule, the one on this side here, is uh, uh, cysteine. And it's just cysteine with the carboxylic acid missing, natural product found in all meat sales. Also found on the end of coenzyme A. <clears throat> and this molecule fit the FDA description of a dietary ingredient. We found out that it was also a very potent antioxidant, so we could not, and you've got to understand the rules of the game. Even though this bound mercury, I can sell it as an antioxidant because you can go buy glutathione at the health food store and it'll say antioxidant. You'll never find glutathione, whose major function in your body is to remove heavy metals, or one of them. They never say, they can't say it removes heavy metals. Even though a lot of people tell you, do this to get rid of the metals out of your body. If they're smart, they know that. But you can't say that. It's a mother may I game with the FDA. It's a kind of the simplest, uh, mind-boggling, maddening uh, group to work with and, and rationale for trying to get good medical care that God could ever put together. I mean, men are incredibly creative at creating dumb systems, and we have one in this case. Okay, but the nice thing about this and what I was looking for is that when you get this thing here with a positive charge, and this Emma? Okay. <laughs> okay. Is this better? No. Okay. Right. But anyway, the, the the reason for this, when I started, decided that I decided that we don't have a good way to get mercury out of the body, and this is what I, I sent a goal on. Said so this is where I'm going to go after. And the first thing I knew is that mercury vapor goes right through the membranes. Hydrophobic. Ethyl mercury from thimerosal is hydrophobic, goes right through the blood-brain barrier. Methyl mercury from fish goes right through cell membranes into the mitochondria, etc. So if I was going to make a chelator to go get that mercury, it had to go through the membrane too. It had to be hydrophobic. And that's what I was trying to do. And when you look at the design, I took a molecule that has two negative charges, coupled to that a molecule, two molecules that were positive charged, and made a molecule that had no charges. And more than that, instead of having the two sulfur groups real close together so the mercury couldn't get it, I decided to put it out when we call it degrees of freedom of rotation, like my hands are the two sulfur groups that combine the mercury, and they can move around and they can get a great big mercury out. They can hit the head. And do that now, and that's that's called coordination chemistry, because with the mercury atom, the most strong bonds are those that are exactly 180 degrees apart. In other words, if you ever try and hold a basketball and hold it, you know, quarter way around, it's very hard to do unless you've got great big hands. But if you hold it on 180 degrees, you, you stabilize it, and that's the most stable bond for mercury is one 180 degrees, and this one does that. So this molecule does it, and it's water insoluble, but it's lipid soluble. And so we checked it out, and it does go through uh, the body, and we're going to show some data here. First of all, 
this molecule won't dissolve in water, but it'll dissolve in alcohol without the mercury there. So you can make a test tube full of metal ions, mercury, mercury, lead, cadmium, copper, iron, to a certain level, 50 parts per million, and then you can dissolve the OSR, the NBMEI, in alcohol and drop it on there. And when you do, you see a white precipitate form that goes down to the bottom, and what it is, it takes 90, over 99% of these metals out of the water, and it forms a pellet. Now, you can take that pellet, and you can try to dissolve it with pH 1 or pH 12 water. I mean, that's very acidic or incredibly basic. It won't dissolve. It'll sit there for 60 hours without releasing any of the mercury. You can try to dissolve it in all the organics that you would normally use that might be around, and you cannot dissolve that NBMI mercury complex. It just is not soluble. In other words, it binds it as tightly as anything that's around. And so this is the molecule we decided we wanted. We wanted to see what it would do uh, another thing. So this is, the, it takes heating to above 230 degrees centigrade to bake the NBMI to close it to reset. You don't even come close to that, you know, on the face of the earth unless you're in an oven somewhere. So we can say that this complex is very stable. We want to know, is it toxic? Because these are the first experiments we did when we had this molecule. You don't want to make something that kills worse than the, the toxin you're trying to get rid of. We're trying to get rid of mercury. So we took rats, and on the first day, we put in 100, 200, and 300 micromoles per kilogram body weight, injecting it under the skin, the flab of the skin of the stomach of those animals. So there was no question about them to eat it. We waited three days, and they looked pretty good. They didn't act sick at all because we had one that was getting nothing, and we weighed them. They all weighed the same. Then we doubled this one, put another 100, and we did this on day four, 200, 300, And we went to day seven because they didn't get sick. As a matter of fact, they started having show coats. I mean, they started looking slick. The, this one here was staying kind of gray. You know how you've seen rats, they have kind of like they need a bath. These guys were grooming themselves, slick hair coat, looked like a show dog. And, but anyway, we got up here and finally I got frustrated. Day seven, because this, this is enough to treat heavy metal toxicity up here. Wait, I mean, that right there is. So then I gave them all 1,500, two of them 1,500 at one time, just thinking this will really get them, and it didn't do a thing. So we had this much given to these rats, and what we could assume at this time that injecting this molecule, it wasn't toxic at all. Didn't mean it worked, but it wasn't going to kill them on its own. Uh, so then we sent it off for dietary testing, and we tried to determine an LD50, and that's the amount that kills 50% of the rats. And when we did that, we could go out, because you can only put so much of a volume of a material in a rat's stomach. So they did it three times a day, to get five grams per kilogram body weight, and the rat didn't get sick, didn't die, didn't have any abnormalities. So then we went on, uh, we did a 28-day study where they got it every day for 28 days at one gram per kilogram. And this is a very, very high amount. It's a thousand times higher than you would take if you were trying to treat yourself for mercury toxicity. And we didn't, and at the end of the 28 days, they drew their blood, and they did a total hematology they did a histology, um, I think. I'm trying not to move on. So. <laughs> it's magic. It's a, but anyway, the, 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 but the problem, what, what they found, they, they pulled out every organ in the body, weighted, did histology, microscopy, etc. They couldn't find any single thing that this did at the end of 28 days with massive amounts of this compound being given to them. So it's absolutely without any toxicity to rats over a long extended period of time. It also did not decrease any of the ions in the body. The calcium, magnesium, sodium, potassium, iron, all stayed at normal levels. If you chelate all the zinc, or enough of the zinc in a person, you know what happens, you develop diarrhea. They didn't have diarrhea either. We couldn't find anything, and their, their copper levels seemed to stay up there. Uh, so we had the... Uh, we also sent them off for mutagenesis study and for uh, endotoxin. We couldn't find anything. And these compounds are under study are not FDA approved to treat any illness or disease. I just want to say that right now, even though it was sold for a long time. We do have this compound. We've sent it to the European Medicines Agency. 
an application for orphan drug status, and the report came back last week, and we're doing real good. We're going to, we're going to I think, be able to take this and have it tested uh, and, and perhaps approved as a drug uh, in Europe. Now, and this is some of the data that we had to give them to show that. If you take this compound orally, in two hour two, it increases at its highest peak in, in your plasma, and at the end of 24 hours, it's down about eightfold. So it goes into the blood, peaks, and comes down, has a half-life of about seven hours, and it does it, it even gets into the brain like 6.1 to 52, comes down to 2.57 and 0.2. The kidney, liver, spleen, bone marrow, even goes up in the bone marrow, and small intestine, and the subcutaneous fat. As a matter of fact, it likes the fat a lot. And that really makes it nice, because that's where a lot of the mercury that's being leaked into your body likes to go also. And so we, we, we've uh, shown that the pharmacokinetics indicate that this molecule goes where mercury goes, and hopefully can bind it and render it. When we look at the urine and fecal excretion mercury, and then this is for those who argue about this, if you didn't put anything in there, 0.72 um, parts per billion come out in the urine, 132 parts per billion come out in the feces. And if we gave mercury, it went up. These are the rats that got mercury alone. It's up very high. If you put in the NBI, it still comes out fecally, massively, more than it does in the in urine. And NBMI alone kind of uh, increases the amount that comes out, but not much different. They're about the same as the unexposed. So this molecule does not block mercury from coming out, but it doesn't cause it to come out in any great big dose. You just keep taking it. But what we do know, Well, I should, I'll, I'll finish this off. This is the level in the different organs with and without NBMI. This is unexposed, mercury alone, HG, and NBMI only. And what you see is that there is a change. If you look at the unexposed, these rats weren't supposed to have any mercury at all. Now, that tells you how good our, our food sources are, because when you feed rat, you know, meat from leftover from butchering a cow and other things. But you can see that there's, there's mercury that we can detect in rats that are fed chow that is not uh, that doesn't have mercury added to it for certain and hopefully none in it. But look at the difference in the two where we talk about the uh, the interperitoneal and epidemial fat. See this one here is highest, this one's lower. You go over here it, with MBMI, it flips it up. It seems like MBMI puts the mercury into the epidemial fat from the interperitoneal fat. It kind of drags it in that direction and you see it here versus here also. So I think we have to do more studies on this, but I think we're finding a way that this molecule will allow us to get fat or get mercury out of the body. This is the, this is the, uh, really the best experiment of the group. We treated rats, and we did this at several different um, weights, but did we, rats, what we would do is we would inject them with mercury chloride at a level we know would kill them but it would take a certain period of time. We did one milligram per kilogram body weight, two, and then we shot up to 14. 20 minutes after we gave them the mercury on, say, injecting it under the flab on the left side, we put the NBMI, injected it under the flab on the right side. And here's the untreated control group, and you come down here. A means they're alive. This is the amount of NBMI we gave them. These got none, and these rats were all dead at the end of 24 hours or near 24 hours, whereas these rats were alive. I mean, they just never showed any sign of getting sick at all. And we did this several times. Here's a, here's a, a, a combination of all of them with no treatment. If we gave 14 milligrams per kilogram body weight down here, they were most of them dead in six hours. Half of them were dead in six hours. They're all dead in 12. These lived out to 20, past 24 hours, but then they started, uh, they, they didn't die of quivers or convulsions like these rats did, but three, two of them died. So we had a problem, two out of the ten uh, kicked a bucket. But these rats never died. These rats all died. So we have a compound that we know with one injection. Now, we could have gone and injected and injected every day, but we just gave them one injection after the mercury insult and uh, saved their lives. Same thing. In the study where we measured the amount in the tissues, we gave six tenths of a lethal dose. The rats that did not get got mercury alone. Two of the ten died. All of them had blood in their urine and in their feces. They all lost weight. They all became ataxic, couldn't walk straight, and uh, stopped grooming and stopped eating. 
when we gave that same group of rats with the same amount, the NBMI, that you couldn't tell them from the controls. They totally survived. So we know we have something that when it gets in the body, does everything that it's supposed to do. So this molecule, we, we found out, you know, not only binds mercury and renders it non-toxic, it had ORAC scores. This is scores of how well it binds to hydroxy radicals. These scores are very high, 199,000 per 100 grams and 299,000. There's almost nothing in a dietary spectrum that matches this. And this is very critical because it's saying while mercury, you're getting mercury off the enzymes, and you're also scavenging the hydroxy radicals that are made by the mercury that are doing damage. So it has a two-prong attack, getting rid of the mercury. Somebody tell me when I'm getting near the... Okay, I'll be done with that. Okay, and here's what happens with this molecule. For uh, this is uh, the compound we called it OSR at that time. This is an slide. Here are the hydroxy radicals that are damaging. And then when you do this, you form. When we put this in and did mass spectrometry, looking at liver homogenous, it forms uh, these two compounds. These are both oxidized. They turn into sulfates. Well, so when you turn it into a sulfate, that's nothing better could happen for you, because sulfates are what we attach to molecules like benzene. I think I got here. Yeah, here's how your body gets rid of benzene. Phase one, you put a hydroxyl group on. Phase two, you add a sulfate to it. And this now is water soluble because it has charges. And we have in our body a mechanism, just like glutathione, that will recognize sulfate labeled molecules and kick them out of the body. This is how we detoxify a lot of uh, even uh, Tylenol is sulfated to some extent and excreted. So if we go back up to this one, we're, it's ending up to be a sulfate. And it's got a process, a natural process to get rid of it. That's the reason it goes up and the reason it comes down. And it doesn't build up in the body and it's not toxic. So this is the ORAC scores, the ability to react with hydroxy radicals of the compound compared to sahi berry juice, dark chocolate, pomegranates, blueberries, garlic, cranberries, spinach. So you can see, taking this and the fact, as many of you know, the ORAC score of foods has nothing to do with its ability to increase your glutathione levels. It kind of correlates, but it doesn't correlate well at all because the other aspect you have is can it get in the cell to scavenge the hydroxy radicals? How fast is it cleared from the, the blood? And so when we look at the ORAC scores, there's just a general idea that they'll work good at preventing oxidative stress in your body. Because some ORAC scores that have lower levels, like pomegranates, may work better than acai berry juice. Now, I don't know that for a fact, those two for a fact, but it doesn't. But anyway, we've, we've seen this. This compound really does have two. And this is the data when we got this. You know, I'm a smart guy, but I didn't realize it would do this. I mean, this is just God getting his hand in the mess and stirring it up a little bit. This is when we decided that we was no longer going to go for a drug, but we were going to sell it as an antioxidant because that was one of its major functions. And, and I still believe I was right on that, that it should have been there because if we were there today, a lot of people suffering from oxidative stress would be taking this molecule and a lot better. So. And here's a study that we had done by some friends of ours, medical doctors that had autistic children. All the people here were their children or their parents. And this was an eight-year-old white male, uh, eight-year-old white female, uh, nine-year-old. Uh, these were all these children were all suffering from some neurological dysfunction. But the interesting thing is, if you look at the GSH over the GSSG ratios, this person at baseline zero time went from 40 to 53 to 87. This person went from 43 to 37 to 87. This person went from 24 to 32 to 64. This person went from 14 to 22 to 28. In other words, every one of these people taking this over a 12-week period saw a massive change in the increase in the reduced glutathione in their red blood cells, indicating that it's happening in the rest of the body also. And this was the only change. In this particular food safety study, we measured over 200 parameters, you know, in the blood and in the urine for these people. Nothing went abnormal. And the only thing that changed dramatically was the reduced equivalent. The, re the glutathione levels went up dramatically. 
indicating that the molecule was uh, working very well as a, a, an antioxidant. These are older people, 72-year-old white male, diagnosed with early Alzheimer's, the white female, 71, and the 73-year-old. And again, their levels are lower because they're old. Went from 11 to 16 to 48.8. 17 to 36 to 28, 15 to 42 to 69 in the ratios, indicating a marked improvement in the glutathione or the redox equivalents of these, these patients, indicating it was working. Nothing here, none of these other molecules, I didn't point that out, the cysteine or these other aspects of thiolas in the blood changed at all. The only one that changed was that the glutathione levels went up as we would expect if you scavenge hydroxy radicals. The other thing that happened is the glutathione S transferase, the enzyme that attaches glutathione to toxins. These people didn't, we couldn't, it was low in all of them. And then on, after the first month, it went up in two of them. At the end of two months, it went up almost to normal levels in all of them, indicating that the enzyme that you use to attach glutathione to toxic molecules was being activated with the longer time that they were on the, the antioxidant compound that we have. So. The conclusions we can say is non-toxic lipid soluble free radical scavenging antioxidant has been developed and found to be without detectable toxicity. It also binds mercury, lead, arsenic, and cadmium. Definitely we have shown it prevents the toxicity instituted by massive exposures to mercury. Uh, 